it is both on, is both online and in person. Um, this uh, building is uh, Blackhawk College Community Education Center. Uh, the main campus is in Moline, Illinois, in the Quad Cities. This building is part of adult education and literacy and, uh, and serves uh, this county and community. Um, Blackhawk also has a campus south of here, uh, which is a, a much larger uh, campus of the college. There's um, exit signs. Um, if necessary, this is an exit that will take you outside the building on, on your right, where you came in is an exit. And when you exit this room, there are exits, um, both directions to the right and left that will take you outside the building. Restrooms, when you leave this conference room, if you go down the hallway, uh, the restrooms are the first alcove on the left, just past the drinking fountain. Um, we have uh, a limited supply of this book, Untapped Talent, and, and I, have, uh, I have some up here. There is no charge for this. Some of you have it, uh, but I would recommend it for those of you who do not have it. It's how second chance hiring works for your business and the community. And, uh, and this is the book that was featured by Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership in their seminar about uh, a higher calling uh, spelled uh, H-I-R-E. And um, so if you want one of these, you can see me at any point. And I just, I'd like to get your name so I know who these are going to. Um, there's a, a card about our American Job Center. Uh, this is an access site. And so we have um, at least three partner organizations that have office people here. Our Title I B Employment and Training. Uh, Sarah Cleveland works in this office. And she is our board functions administrator. And of course, we have Blackhawk College adult education uh, faculty and staff here uh, and administrators. And we have Project Now Community Action Agency is located here. And uh, uh, they provide a lot of supportive services to the community. The, uh, the morning is all here. Uh, we will have a light lunch. Uh, when we wrap up at noon. At one o'clock, we will go to Kiwani Life Skills Reentry Center. And I think most of you are going to go there. Um, vaccination is required. Um, it's okay if it's on your phone. It's okay if it's on paper. And sometimes when we go to facilities of the Illinois Department of Corrections, they don't even ask for it. Um, but that is, that is still a requirement. Uh, when you arrive there, um, cell phones and technology, uh, even smart watches need to be left in your car. And if you use tobacco products, that also needs to be left in your car. Um, I, I usually just empty out my pockets. You'll probably go through a metal detector. Um, but uh, generally, uh, uh, entry into the facility is pretty, pretty simple and straightforward. So now I would like to introduce today's stand-up comedian, <laughs> the, the co-chairman of our committee, Craig, take it away. If you could tell them a little bit about who you are, including which character you are in the sitcom. <laughs> so, so the inside joke, I am Craig Kissinger, uh, Director of Human Resources for National Institute of Supply. And on behalf of the Career Pathways for Targeted Populations, uh, I just, sincere uh, appreciation for filling up this room today, right, on a very important topic. And I think from what Molly said, we, we probably have about 20 online now, Molly. Yeah, so we have about 21. So we have about 40 people, including Mark and I, that are here to talk about this, this great topic. So um, I think that's really says something. So. Thank you for, for coming today. Hopefully, uh, as Mark described, we've got a, a very meaningful presentation, an impactful presentation, particularly during a time where as we look at um, putting people to work, 
and growing the country, right? In order to do that, it takes people, right? And, and at the end of the day, whether you're an employer, whether you're part of the workforce system or a com community partnership, we are all in the business of people. And particularly those people that are in human resources, again, workforce services, community partnerships, th that's why we do what we do. But for people, we would not have a purpose. We would not have employment ourselves, right? So uh, to kick us off, welcome. You know, I, again, appreciate you being here. What we're going to do is we're gonna start out because there's a lot of people here for a lot of different reasons. Um, we're going to expeditiously move around and do uh, introductions so you know who is in the room. I know we all have these start white uh, name tags, but whether I have my glasses on or not, I'm lucky if I can read Mark's name tag from here. So it's gonna uh, be hard to read it. we're going to uh, first, we'll move around the room here, and then we will move around uh, online so we know who's with us online. I would ask that uh, you just simply give your name, your role, and what company you're with. I think uh, there'll be an opportunity for networking afterwards that it'd be great to share with people in the room of what, what brought you here today, right? What, what question are you looking to answer? And, you know, we have some very, very impactful presentations from uh, like some John Corbett and Ben Endress and, and I'm sorry, Brock. Brock, thank you for being here today, uh, that are gonna share their stories that if your question doesn't get answered during the course of their presentation, interact with one of us and, and, and really strive to leave here today with your, your questions answered and, and uh, kind of filled with knowledge of, of what this could, can be, okay? So, um, Let's go ahead and kick it off with Jeff here, and uh, we'll move around the room that way, and then we'll jump to online. Does that work for you, Molly? Excellent. She's shaking her head. Yes. So, somebody's got their... That was me. Awesome. And cool. <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. My name is Jeff Horvath. I'm the Vice President of Operations for PLZ Corp. Uh, an outfit uh, out of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Tori Davis, uh, business services manager with the uh, Department of Employment Security. Ben Andrus, owner of MTM Trailer Manufacturing. Uh, I'm Brock Isbell. I am a returning citizen, released yesterday. I'm Janelle Washington, director for career and technical education at the Illinois Community College Board. Good morning, Monica Pruitt, special populations grant manager, Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunities, Springfield, Illinois. Good morning. That's what I called in. Uh, statewide Manager for Special Population Programs at the Illinois Department of Employment Security out of Chicago. Good morning, Michelle Stiff, Director of Workforce Services Division of Will County, located in Joliet, Illinois. Good morning. Caroline Portlock. I'm the Director of the Workforce Board for Will County. Good morning. Jeff Alspa. I'm with IMEC, um, local regional rep supporting manufacturing. Melissa D. Tamble, I lead the human resources function for PLZ Corp. Alice Liggett, um, I lead the organizational development function at PLZ Corp. Mike Massey, member of the Career Pathways Target Population Committee. Uh, Jim Moore, uh, program director for the Illinois Works Pre Apprenticeship Program, Southwestern Illinois College. Uh, Mike Connolly, I'm uh, Illinois Workforce Innovation Board member, I'm chairman of the um, Apprenticeship Illinois Committee. And the director of workforce development, Southwest Illinois. Uh, Tom Wendorf, I'm a member of the Illinois Workforce Innovation Board. I'm co chair of the Business Engagement Committee. Uh, good morning. I'm Yolanda Clark with Northern Illinois University Center for Governmental Studies. I'm a senior research specialist with the Workforce Development Team. Kenneth Dickerson, I'm NIU and Workforce Brian Richard, also with NIU. Sarah Cleveland, Board Function Administrator for American Job Center. Awesome. Uh, Molly, if we could, oh, Mark, did you introduce yourself? Yeah, you did it. We did. Again. Outstanding. <laughs> Sorry. So, Molly, can we move through who's online? It would be great if their face could pop up. Uh, make it, I know there's a presentation mode so that it features the speaker when they talk. 
you can start with yourself. Sure. So what I'll do is I'll introduce myself and then I'll call on people online to make it easier. Uh, Thank to you. Answer. So I'm Molly Cook. I support the CPTP and I'm a consultant with the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support. I'll turn it over to Sarah Blaylock. Hi all, I'm Sarah Boylock and I am with Molly with the Illinois Center for Specialized Support and I'll be helping support today's meeting. Marcy? Hi, I'm Marcy Johnson. I'm the Director for CT and Innovation at the Illinois State Board of Education and also co-chair of the Opportunity Youth Subcommittee of this committee. <laughs> Lee? Lee Reese, I'm the Director of Workforce Development for St. Clair, Clinton, Monroe, Randolph, and Washington counties. Molly Dolly? Hi everyone. Good morning. Molly Dowling, Executive Director with OAI, or Workforce Organization in Chicago. Ben? Good morning, everybody. I'm Ben Greer. I'm the Associate Director for Adult Education and Literacy with the Illinois Community College Board, working out of the Chicago office. Blanche? Hi, Blanche Shoup. I'm the Workforce Director for the Nine County area in Western Illinois. Great. Great. Teresa? Hi, I'm Teresa Cherry. I'm the Director of Programs for the um, Workforce Area in Rock Island, Henry, and Mercer Counties. Abram? Good morning, everybody. I'm a Program Manager overseeing our reentry portfolio with the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. Melina? I'm Melina Lane. I'm St. Clair County Intergovernmental Grants Department Youth Program, but I'm also interested in the returning citizens. Dwight? Good morning. I'm Dwight Klein. I'm the Director of Human Resources for Julie Incorporated, located out of Joliet. Pat? Sorry. Uh, good morning. I'm Pat Maher. I'm Director of Civic Engagement for SPR. We are a uh, Chicago and Milwaukee based uh, technology firm. Sandra? Hi, I'm Sandy. I am one of the new career specialists for the WIOA Youth Program. Susan? I'm Susan Zelnio. I work for the Moline Foundation taking care of workforce development. LaDonna? I'm LaDonna Henson. I'm the director of the Education and Developmental Center at SIU in Carbondale. Um, we work with people with disabilities as well as returning citizens. Keith, Keith. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Keith Pearson. I'm the Skilled Trades Program Manager for United Rentals. Um, United is a global company. We're the largest equipment rental company in the world. Uh, 22,000 staffs in uh, 1,300 locations across the North America right now. And we're very interested in this program to see what it can do for our recruitment efforts. Dina? All right, we'll come back to Dina. Laura? Okay, I'm gonna keep going down the list. Suzette? Shannon? Hello, I'm Shannon Hampton, DCO, Office of Employment and Training, and I work on special populations. Laura, I just saw you come off mute, so I'll go back to you. Yeah, sorry. Good morning, everyone. Laura Gurgley, um, board manager here in Lake County, Illinois. Perfect. Tierney? Amy? Good morning, everyone. Amy Julian. I'm the director for the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support and um, work with special populations, career pathways, all of those wonderful topics. Thank you. Great. Mark. Oh, Mark, we already have. We already met Mark Loman. Sorry. And then Sharon. Okay, so we'll do one last call. Anyone who hasn't had a chance to introduce yourselves on Zoom, feel free to come off mute uh, in the next 10 seconds or so and, and share your name and organization. Okay. 
All right, Craig, I think we're- I'll allow you to introduce Dina, she's in there. What'd you say? Dina's in the chat. Oh, perfect. Okay, sorry. Oh, thanks for watching that for me. Um, yes, yeah, so Dina is here um, from the Skills for Chicago Lands Future. And Dina mentioned that there's some connectivity issues. So Dina can hear us, so no worries. And, and this is Dina's introduction. And I will go ahead and go back to sharing the PowerPoint. Awesome. So um, really want to go about, this is an interesting topic, right? And when we talk about career pathways for targeted populations, we talk about returning citizens or second chance citizens. Uh, we have a subcommittee on uh, opportunity youth. We have a subcommittee for, um, for people with disabilities, right? So when we talk about these populations, um, we see that there's a cross section of people represented here. And I think we want to, as best as we can, assume positive intent when we talk about different people, right? Uh, in our common everyday language, we may say something that we don't mean to be offensive. We may not know what does somebody want to be called, right? It's particularly in society today. And, and all I ask is that we look to be respectful and assume positive intent, because that's why we're all here today is to kind of have that open and honest conversation and know that there's, there's no silly question, right? Uh, if you have a question, please ask it. And Again, think about your wording if you can, uh, be sensitive to it, but uh, please ask your question because that's why we have this program today. Uh, I know Mark, Mark uh, did introduce me as, as the comedian. That's because, you know, when I'm not being my official roles, uh, I am a little bit of a comedian. So I did start the my visit here with telling Mark that I showed up here in the entire building was dark and locked. Was somebody supposed to meet me? So th that is why I get the, the comedian tag, uh, because I am not above uh, a little bit of antics. But we'll probably keep those to a bit more today, given the seriousness of our, of our topic. So um, moving along, uh, because this is an official quarterly meeting of the IWIB, uh, we uh, have to go through some some uh, logistical stuff that has to be done. So uh, we need to um, approve the minutes from our March 31st meeting and June 30th of uh, this past year. So those that are on the committee, uh, not here as a guest, if, if I can hear a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Thank you, do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, any nays? Thank you. Is approved. Uh, from here, we will move into again, as I described, we have um, other subgroups be besides just returning citizen. So we're going to hear a, a very quick update from each of the, the groups, the subgroups of the career pathways for targeted populations, starting with the disability group. Sure, and um, Craig, just for our minutes, could you let us know who moved and sub-moved the minutes so that we have that? Yeah, so- Jeff Arbeth on, on the motion. And the second was Tom Windorf. Tom Windorf. Okay, Sarah's being amazing right. and doing our minutes, so I wanted to make sure we had those for Sarah. And then okay. everybody said, aye, aye, Captain. Love <laughs> it, thank you for the clarification. Okay, so I'll go ahead and do the disability work group update. On your screen here, you see the charges and priorities for our disability work group. Those of you who are at our June meeting, this is a review slide. Um, our charge is to look at strategies and recommendations and eliminating barriers to employment for individuals with disabilities with our priorities involving service integration, career pathway awareness, and continuous improvement. And our most significant project right now, very exciting, uh, Disability Employment Awareness Month is coming up in October, just two days away. And so we really wanted to work to provide some resources during this month as a work group. 
So we will be hosting a Workforce Wednesday webinar, October 12th from 10 to 1130 on tips and tools for community-based organizations for support, supporting employers and hiring individuals with disabilities. We have a great panel lined up for this webinar. Joining us will be Marcus Diemer from the Workforce Development Unit of DRS. LaDonna Henson, who's on this call with Southern Illinois University, and then we'll also have Garrett Rosiak with Ascendant, which is an organization, or I'm sorry, a business um, focused on hiring individuals with disabilities. And so I'll go ahead and put this link in the chat um, later in the meeting, but you can sign up for this webinar. It's free, and it'll just be a great opportunity for learning about resources and providing a Q&A on um, supporting career pathways. Okay, moving on to Opportunity Youth. Marcy, you want to give a brief update? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> so the Opportunity Youth Group Break Youth Work Group, you can see our charge and priority uh, that we discussed the last time. I think we tweaked them a little bit um, from when we talked in um, June, but this is our, um, our charge. Uh, and that is looking at and providing strategies and recommendations, you know, for access uh, for career pathways and opportunities for um, our youth. Do I have a second slide, Sarah? Yeah. And so here's what our game plan is. Uh, you know, we started out talking about different segments. We've been looking at the barriers. That's where our focus has been um, the last couple months. Uh, we looked at some of the barriers that we're having, such as transportation, um, juvenile justice involvement, foster care, teacher shortage, uh, special populations just struggling to meet classes, that lack of awareness, a career awareness and lack of parent involvement, uh, graduation requirements for in-school youth, um, not enough scheduling time for work-based learning, and then school counselors, the lack of capacity to serve all these students. So this past month and in the coming months, we're going to be looking at what is actually occurring with in-school youth and out-of-school youth. So last month, or I guess it was this month, um, we had um, Eric, <clears throat> Eric Hill and Chris um, Anderson from Skills USA talk to us about all the work um, that they've been doing. So um, you can see that we're making some progress as we move along. Um, it's, it's been very enlightening for us. And um, we plan to meet um, on a regular basis, of course, uh, to make sure that uh, we come up with a plan on what our direction is going to be uh, for the Opportunity Youth after we have um, this list completed. And, um, and so if anybody else is interested and wants to be engaged or you know somebody, let us know. I think that's it, right, Sarah? Perfect. Thank you, Marcy. And, and you'll see a common theme with all these. And Mark's going to talk about returning citizens. The whole idea behind these work groups is on a core, on an annualized basis for each of these quarterly meetings, we want to put on either a, a, a webinar the way the disability group or featuring a, a best practice, such as what we're going to see today in Kiwani, so that we can, can raise up some of the great work that's happening and figure out how do we duplicate that across the state. So hopefully you'll see that as a main theme throughout all these, these meetings. Go ahead, Mark. Our uh, update uh, is gonna be brief because uh, <laughs> our whole day is, uh, is an update about uh, our returning citizens work group. Um, I'm grateful that many of you will be able to stay into the afternoon uh, because you'll get uh, uh, some firsthand experiences. Um, serving returning citizens uh, is something that needs to happen um, uh, for people who are uh, individuals in custody. It also needs to happen for people who are impacted by the justice system, but maybe will not be or never have been incarcerated. And, and it's something that the workforce system engages at all levels. Uh, some of our workforce areas in Illinois and around the country work in, in uh, county jails. And I first found out about this program many years ago uh, through the San Diego, California county jail system. 
Um, our work here is focused on the Illinois Department of Corrections, uh, but also in our region and around the state of Illinois, we have uh, federal penitentiaries and, um, uh, and it's really a win-win-win situation when we, um, as workforce professionals and volunteers, we engage with this community. Um, we, we really are serving the business community and we're in a very weird economy right now um, that uh, businesses need people. And, and so all of these work groups and, uh, and special populations can benefit because we have more business people. And I use the term broadly, it could include not-for-profit employers, it could include governmental employers. There's just a lot of opportunity right now. And as the book says, untapped talent. So that's, that's why we're here today. And, uh, um, and we will have the opportunity at Kiwani Life Skills Reentry Center uh, this morning, we're going to hear from Ben Endress and his family owns and operates uh, Midwest Trailer Manufacturing, and, and Brock has been in an on-the-job training contract there through day release, and as far as an update, that's probably one of the more significant things that we've accomplished recently with the Illinois Department of Corrections, that we have put um, six people into on-the-job training contracts at MTM and three people uh, into a family, another family-owned business in OJT contracts and construction. So we will have an opportunity to go visit that uh, operating uh, manufacturing facility. And, and then as part of Blackhawk College across the parking lot, uh, and it's a long day, and I know some of you uh, have to get back on the road, but just to describe it, the Welding and Technology Center has also been used by Blackhawk College and Lakeland College uh, with staff here from their um, program inside of correctional institutions. And that welding facility has three of the main, major manufacturers of welding equipment and teaches every type of welding uh, possible here. Um, and it is used for youth and adults in the community and, uh, and has been used for individuals in custody on day release. Wonderful. The uh, Molly just has another slide, but the slides are, are similar to what you've seen. So um, the, uh, and I kind of, I kind of already overlapped into the next category, Molly, um, introduction to the meeting theme, career pathways for returning citizens. So. Um, I think with the, unless anybody has any questions, either logistical questions about today or general questions about uh, uh, initiatives <clears throat> for uh, returning citizens and justice involved individuals, we can move along to our features this morning. Great. So it looks like first we have uh, Ben Endress. All right, if I stay sitting, or you want me to stand? Okay. I'm going to stand up. If, <laughs> okay. Molly, Molly, are you getting uh, Ben on camera okay? Um, so it's a little hard to see Ben. However, we can hear Ben well. So it would be helpful, I think, if Ben came up by you in the front. That would be really helpful for those of us on Zoom. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Ben. Okay, first of all, I want to thank all of you that have had your hand in serving the returning citizen uh, population. Um, as I've talked with uh, the day release um, returning citizens that work for us, um, each of them expressed their gratitude for the uh, opportunity that they've had. And without your partnership, it would be a little bit harder to do it just on our own. So thank you very much for um, each of you that have had your hand in that. Um, 
MTM Trailer Manufacturing started in 2016 by myself and my three brothers. Um, it's about a 70 employee company. We build about 300 uh, semi dump trailers per year that serve mostly Chicago market, but we also have a division out in Boston. And, um, um, and then we also have a uh, kind of our mother organization that's making general contractors in Bradford, Illinois, that myself and two of my other brothers own. And they also have uh, uh, employed three returning citizens as well. Um, my first experience was in 2014. Um, I had a gentleman uh, apply with me um, looking for a job. This is back in making general contractors. And uh, he had told me he had seven felonies and he just didn't think anybody would hire him. Um, and there was something in him that, that just made me feel like uh, that I should give him a chance. And um, he turned out to be a very, a uh, very good employee, worked really hard. Um, we gave him a little bit of responsibility, a, a little at a time, and he ended up being a, a project supervisor for us and did a really fantastic job. So I, um, I didn't bother to check with HR about hiring him. I might have got shot down, but I'm, <laughs> I'm a business owner, a little bit riskier anyway. Um, it really didn't bother me too bad um, uh, to take that risk. And, uh, and it was a very good risk. And, I, and I've learned a lot through him and um, <clears throat> learned to see that they're uh, just good people that make some bad choices and get caught. Um, that's really the only difference. Um, <clears throat> so that, that, that experience then, uh, one, once a, uh, the Kiwani facility opened up, um, and, and I think it might have been Rauner originally. Governor Rauner was, was a little more pushing for the uh, reentry center. And there was, uh, uh, it, it hit the spotlight a little bit more. And then um, a few individuals, um, Mike Massey for one, really wanted me to get involved with uh, trying to hire those that, have, uh, um, that had been released. And, and uh, over time, um, we did that. And so currently MTM does have six uh, uh, on the job, or five on the job contracts um, working for us uh, pre-release. Pre and then we've had about six post-release. Um, out of those six post-release, uh, release, um, Brock is employed, um, we've got another, fella currently employed and then we've had four um that were employed uh three of them went off to, to back at work for us for a while and then went back to their um, hometowns and, and found jobs elsewhere and i think one got back into drugs and went back to prison from, from my understanding so it's not all success stories but there's a lot of good success stories that uh we're really excited to be helping these individuals. It's been a real good win-win. Um, so the, the challenges that we've found over the last um, three years, I guess, of, of doing this, um, and, and probably a little bit more recently, is uh, the, the work schedules for the individuals that are still incarcerated coming over on a day release. Um, Working with the IDOC, um, well, I guess I should step back a little bit. Our work schedule is uh, four days a week, and we work 10-hour days. So it starts at 6 a.m., it ends at 4.30. With the guards that they need to, uh, to send over, um, that they send uh, one or two guards, well, one per three or four um, <coughs> returning citizens, I guess is, is how they... Um, what they try to send. Um, their guard schedule starts, I think, at about seven o'clock. So the uh, uh, the employees can't come over into our facility until about seven thirty, and then they have to leave by uh, two thirty. So that we just get about six hours, wherein all of our other employee employees get ten hours. So it makes it a little bit more challenging um, scheduling in a manufacturing facility where. 
one um, one station depends on the next, and so that's been a little bit of a shuffle and around and so forth. But it's uh, but it, but it's worked out okay. Another challenge that was really unforeseen about uh, two months ago, there was a little bit of a COVID outbreak in the prison, so uh, they locked everybody down for ten days straight, and so we we had uh, five. I think it was five that, that just couldn't come over. And that uh, that's tough on a manufacturing business as well. Um, so it, it, it for us, it, it, we realized the need for cross-training was much greater if we're uh, <clears throat> depending on folks that just can't make it because of not their own choice, but the choice of the uh, Department of Corrections to not make an allowance for, for that. Um, other challenges is just uh, it takes our management a little extra time um, to work with the DOC to work um, on the job contracts. It just you know it is what it is. It takes time, and that's okay. Um, startup as we're getting more of the system going, you know I think that we'll have a better understanding between organizations, and we can work a little bit more seamlessly. Um, you know how people are. They do send guards over, and the guards um, probably get fairly bored sometimes. And so I sometimes will walk through, and they're maybe chatting with my supervisors or kind of chatting. So that creates a, yeah, you know, that's probably more discipline on our managers to say, hey, I, I can't just sit and chat. But, but yeah, that, that's just that's just people, you know. Um, um, so on the job contracts, um, while they are good and it's really good for the uh, uh, for the employee, that also takes time in our management to make sure that the the training is being facilitated, and we we have to do a little bit more cross training. We uh, just have to spend a little more, more time, and that is what the subsidy is for, and we appreciate that. And I think if I look at a net, is there a net gain or loss on the on the subsidy that we receive compared to the value, it's really, really hard to tell. It's hard to quantify. So we we chalk it up to we don't know if we actually gain value or lose value. It's just kind of an even, even deal. So it's um, our challenge here at Kiwani isn't right now. It's it's not necessarily workforce. We do have a lot of applicants. Um, our, our um, you know, our, we, we raised our wages some, and um, that kind of steals a few from Great Dane and so forth. So we try to be a little bit on the higher end in the local area. Um, you know, obviously we, we can't compete with John Deere and, and uh, Caterpillar on when you add benefits and wages, but for around here, we're, we're, we hope to be just a little on the top end. I think our average wage probably for the returning citizens is um, well, what were you at, Brock, when you I started in sixteen fifty. I currently think nineteen dollars now. Okay. Okay. So in uh, seven months or so. Um went from sixteen fifty to nineteen. Yeah. Okay. So they they evaluate them pretty often and try to give people what Worth, but our, our, our ranges are probably from that 1650 to 25 to 26 bucks an hour. Uh, with what we pay. Uh, so, so, workforce hasn't been a real, real struggle of our so other than during COVID, but 25% of the people are gone at any given day because they had to stay home for a sniffle or what you know, whatever. Um, but, um, Another little bit of a challenge for us or a challenge in these programs is when a when a, a day release um, employee is almost near to the end of their um, uh, release date. <clears throat> so the value an employer gets may, you know, if you have them for a, uh, at least nine months to a year, you can train them, they know what they're doing, and then they can really bring value. And so if we bring them on with five months or, or less on their uh, uh, on 
their release date, um, you know, it doesn't bring as much value to an employer unless they do stay, which we're, we're kind of in the opinion, we want what's best for the employee. So if they want to stay, we'd love to have them work. If they want to go back to their family or go back to where they'll be supported more, hey, that's a win for them. Because overall, the whole vision is, is reduce recidivism. Um, you hope they have a good life. You hope you never see them back into the prison system and it benefits all of society um, with that. The benefits um, <clears throat> is it's a very consistent work, workforce. Um, they are eager to come to work every single day because the money they make, they can put it into their bank account and they have money when they get released and they can pay their fines. They can get housing, they can get transportation. Um, so they are never gone. I mean, never gone unless, uh, unless there's something out, outside of their circumstances. So that, that's really big um, to be able to uh, count on that. And they are very highly motivated guys that want to be there because if they um, get let go or fired, there's plenty more that would love to come over for work. So. And they understand that. Um, physically, we found that they're all in very good shape. Um, and so um, that's something some of our other employees aren't maybe in the best shape. So. <laughs> um, and, and, our, and our work is hard. I mean, they, they, it's very hard work in manufacturing. And so have a strong back and strong arms and be healthy, uh, it's a big thing. And, and the, in the heavy manufacturing world. Uh, they have excellent behavior and attitude. And I think that also stems from they want to be there. Um, they, they, many of them that I've talked to, um, you know, your self-worth just goes down when you're in prison and you're not doing anything. Um, you know, I, it, they, the, their self-worth has, has become so much uh, feeling so much more good about themselves that they can actually go to work. Um, another benefit um, is really our regular employees um, have this feeling that um, they are contributing to the greater good as well. Um, the reception from our current workforce has just been tremendous. Um, anywhere from the top supervisors down to the line worker. They just uh, really love having them come. And uh, I think there's been a lot of good friendships and uh, it's been really rewarding to see that. Um, and then once, uh, uh, once the returning citizens have been released, I've, I've seen where that friendship is carried over and it really helps them transition out of prison into the into mainstream. Um, and then just personally, it's just, a, it's been a very rewarding to be able to, um, see changed lives and, um, develop relationships with them, um, learn their stories and, uh, it's, it's been a, been a real blessing. How much time do I have? minutes sure okay um, so I, I did I have gotten to know um, uh, eight well nine including Brock but I'll let him tell his story so I've got a couple just just a little bit of a history on all of these guys that work for us um, and I've asked them different questions and so forth so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of quickly go through. Um, some of these guys' stories, and they and I when I talked to them, I said, "Do you mind if I share your stories?" I don't, and they're and they they were they're all very open, very transparent. Um, wanted me to share their stories, and, and really um, are ex all of them extremely appreciative for what everybody does to to help them come back in and succeed. So, uh, the first guy was Philip. He went into prison when he was 17 years old. Um, he's 34 now. He was convicted of uh, 
selling and distributing meth, uh, stolen weapons charges. He had been in multiple times. Um, his release date is, and he works for MTM. His release date is uh, January 25th of 2023. So he's got about four months left on his record or on his sentence. Um, he, uh, I asked him what the worst thing about being in prison was, and he said that at many of the other facilities, it's just the um, people don't want to change. And he goes, that's the most disheartening thing to be in a group of people that don't really want to change. But he did say, when I came to Kiwani Life Center, um, he said probably 90% of the people want change and find hope that there is um, a way to change. So that, that's made me really feel good about the Kiwani Life Center and what they're uh, trying to accomplish. Um, I asked him about his work release, how that has impacted him. He's been working for us for about, uh, I think in four months now, maybe. Um, he said that uh, it's really good to get acclimated to the outside world. Um, he said uh, the skills that he is learning is invaluable. And he said money in his pocket um, is really going to help him when he gets out to be able to um, rent a place and, and um, get what he needs to, to survive. I said, what do you think is the, the number one thing that will help you from not coming back into prison? And he said employment. <clears throat> employment by far is the number one thing because he had um, been in prison for about five different, I believe four or five different times. And each time um, he would he would get released. He had a felony on his record. He just really couldn't get a job, couldn't get a meaningful job. And he said it was just a lot better money selling meth than, um, than going to work in work that he even couldn't find. And so his, his thing is that employment, he feels like will keep him um, from going back into that. Uh, the next fella is Marlon, and he's 56 years old. He entered prison when he was 41. He had gotten charged with home invasion. <coughs> he helped him, and he got 20 years for it, and he has to serve mandatory 85% of his time. He's been in for 15 years, and he gets out um, December of 2024. And uh, uh, I asked him what the worst part of being in prison, and he said being away from his family. He's got a daughter uh, that he still has contact with, but it's really hard to be uh, away from his daughter. And he said another thing is just the embarrassment of what he did and what people think. Um, kind of the guards look at him as being sort of some substandard, or not all of them, but some of them. So it's just really hard to that embarrassment. Um, he said he liked the reentry center. Uh, he goes, it's different than anything else I've ever experienced, any other prison I've been to, and we're just treated with uh, much more respect. And I asked him about his, his work release because he's been here. He started with, uh, with Brock, Marlon did, um, about seven, eight months ago. He says it's been great. He loves to work. He would do it for free. Um, <laughs> uh, he goes, he loves his craft. He was an iron worker um, <clears throat> up until 41 years old when he got arrested. So he, he was really great at his craft. Um, and he would like to work every day, all day, he said, but he can. But he can only work five days a week. Um, the next fella is Johnny Ray. He was. Um, um, he's age 53. He's been in prison since he was 22. He was charged with murder, first degree murder. Um, he had, he got 75 years and, uh, with a 50% mandatory. So he is set to be released in 24, uh, December 24th. Um, his, his story, he, his story was a little different in that um, he said he was just really drunk and, and, uh, him and his buddy, um, 
Yeah, maybe I shouldn't go into the whole story of that. He said we could, but it, it was it was a it was a little different murder story. Um, but his hardest thing about being in prison was the death, death of people. And he said, when you're in prison and you see a guy have hope and then he gets cancer and it's a year before he's being released, he goes, that is just devastating. Because these guys get, they they get to love each other. I mean, they, they you know, they're real people with real emotions. And, and uh, he said that was really hard on him. And he says, and death of people on the outside is really, really hard uh, because you just don't, to go to your mother's funeral where you don't get to when people die and, and you never have a chance. So that was that's hard on him. Um he liked uh Kiwani Life Rancher Center because um one thing there, he has there's air conditioning and, and he goes no, <laughs> <laughs> no, he, nowhere else he was at had air conditioning and now he can just sleep like a baby. Um, uh, Interacting with people on a day release has been fantastic, he said, and get, getting treated like a human being has really been um, really rewarding going to work and being just one of the guys. Um, and I asked him if he feared what his fears were of getting out. He says, I really don't have any fears. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. And, um, and, with, and he said with the training he has, um, he's, uh, he's very confident that be able to go find a job and, and the, the nice thing is is you know each of these employees we've um i mean our supervisors love them they they they, they are the hard some of the hardest workers we have so there's no doubt there's an open door for them to come back and if they don't want to come back and they want to go somewhere else they'll get a very good referral from us so hopefully our other employee, employers can look past the felonies on the records and go on recommendations that these guys are really hard workers and will add value to their company. The other fellow, uh, Leondas, he, um, he works there at MTM. Um, he went into prison when he was 18. He's 41. He got um, convicted of murder. Um, he got 26 years with no chance of uh, early release. He's got uh, a release date of 2025, so he's, he's getting close. Um, he grew up in downtown uh, Los Angeles and grew up in a drug-infested neighborhood with gang activities. And so that's all he knew. He, he couldn't. There were times where he's like, there's got to be something better than this, but his dad sold drugs and his mom sold drugs and he, he didn't know any other way out of it. And so he learned to survive like a gang member and and um, he found himself in Illinois and, 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 and he said he, he was being stalked by somebody, some people, and, and he just reacted like he would out in the gangs and he took his gun out and shot him. And, um, and uh, very remorseful, um, and he, he won't he won't do a day over um, of what he was um, scheduled to do because of good behavior and, and everything. But uh, I asked him um, how is the work release impacted him, and he says it's impacted my entire life. It's just a breath of fresh air. He goes, I feel useful, I feel valued, and um, I feel alive. So uh, he also said social exposure to the free world has just been wonderful. His skill development, um, getting paid, he said, is nice, but I'd, I'd rather have a lot of the other stuff than get paid. Um, and he says that, boy, that's six, and, six hours of freedom every day. Um, it's just been wonderful. And he said the people are very nice that he, that he works with. So, and he has no fears of uh, getting out of prison on what he'll do, and he has no fears that he'll ever be back. So, we're talking an 18 year old kid that just didn't know any difference. And now he's 41. He'll be 43 when he returns. So, I, I think um, people can't change over time. We give them a chance. Um, you know, they, that'll really help them. 
uh, Richard. He was from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. He had been in prison five different times. Um, he got charged with possession of you know, intent of selling drugs, and that's just kind of all he knew. Um, Joe Bella. Um, he, uh, um, he said the toughest thing is just being away from, from family and then just not having freedom. Um, he, I asked him about his work release um, experience and how it impacted, and he goes, there's just a lot of hope. He says, if, if complete strangers have faith in me, then that boosts my confidence. Um, So over at Macon, we've got three um, three fellows working. Uh, one's, one is James. He, he's been in prison since he's 17 years old, and he's 44 now. So he spent 27 years in prison, um, and uh, he'd been in about four or five times, and his latest time that he got 15 years for was aggravated robbery. Um, <clears throat> and his he's got three kids. Um, so since he's been in and out of prison, there were times when he was he was free, and he um, he, uh, he might have gotten married. That um, he's got three children, and, and the greatest thing for him about being able to be employed is, um, you know, obviously they can sock away a lot of money because I don't think they have to pay uh, probably anything. Don't really have any living expenses that I know of. They don't really pay the DOC anything. So they sock it away, but he's been able to send money back um, to the mother of his children to help uh, while he's incarcerated. And that just gives him a feeling of self-worth like no other. Um, so they're all looking forward to him coming back. Um, and he also has some fines that he never paid. He goes, they remember it, you know, court costs. <laughs> That, that, that doesn't go away. So that really helps them out um, if they have some, some money saved back. Um, two more here. One is Charles. He went in at age 32. He's, he's age 44 now. He got 18 years for aggravated battery with a firearm intent to kill. Um, his related, release date is 2025. He really misses raising his kids. Um, um, his day release, he feels a part of something. He's got more self worth, and he gets to provide. He sends money back home as well. Um, he has no fear of of committing a, another crime and coming back into prison, but he does have a fear of just failing um, as a person. So. And then, um, kind of, a, this is probably one of the sadder. Saturn ones that I've when I talked with them. Um, this young fellow was 17 years old when he went into prison, and um, he's age 38 now. He got 22 years for murder. He, he was um, his story started when he was probably six years old, and his parents um, just couldn't um, couldn't raise him. Um, he says, yeah, that they just, I don't know the whole story behind it, but they gave him up to the state. Um, state raised him for a while. He went to different group homes. Um, he, uh, got shuffled around a lot. And finally, a, a family from Rockford, Illinois, um, um, fostered him and then, and then, um, adopted him. And so he heavy, heavy into drugs. And his um, his grandparents were maybe the only ones that tried to. 
tried to help, they just really couldn't. Um, but any, anyway, he, he got really big into drugs and was his judgment was completely impaired. And he got into a bad argument with his grandpa and he took his grandpa's life. Yeah, I really like this kid. I call him a kid. I guess he's 38, but he just has a so, so I mean, what's what's powerful to me? I'll break down some numbers. I guess when I talk about this topic, when any of us can talk about this topic, and you think 17 years ago, 15 years ago, 30 years ago, 27 years ago, what decisions were we making and what behaviors? And are we the same people we are today? Right? And, and that's what has really shifted my perspective as an HR professional, as a business professional that maybe more of a business professional that my craft is HR, but as a human being and as a Christian, right? That we are different. We may, you know, I could talk about how I, I almost flunked out of college. Now I'm the head of human resources, right? I mean, we all have a story. Like I said, some of these people just got caught in their circumstance, but they, they're in this place for a reason and they, they want to be there. Um, sit next to you. I appreciate your passion and the emotion that goes along with it, right? And it's, you know, too often, just like we set those ground rules, we... You know, stereotypes exist for a reason, right? They, they define when you look at stereotypes, that's how we process information. That's why we can tell, we can read a sentence because we group stuff together. The brain normally groups common things together, right? But we place that stereotype on inmates, on returning citizens. But what we've got to realize, not everybody fits a stereotype, whether it be an ethnic stereotype, a religious stereotype, a returning citizen, an inmate stereotype. Um, appreciate you, yeah. you sharing that story. Yeah, yeah. That was my last one, and um, he gets released in 2024. He made a spiritual change in, in his prison, and he's got the sweetest, most peaceful. Uh, look and talk that I've, I've seen in a long time and um, he comes to work with a smile and he uh, is extremely grateful for anything that he's been given and I guess that just speaks to when we work together um, we can definitely affect people's lives. Mark can we ask questions now? We have a question sure. for Ben. ben. Prior to you doing this program, do you know approximately what your turnover rate was within your company? We we never kept those numbers. Okay, um, fair enough. Yeah, we weren't. Uh, yeah, I, I started the companies and we weren't real sophistic sophisticated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. Uh, and, and, it, 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 we need to be a little because I think Macon has maybe 120 people okay. coming for. So we've gotten sophisticated over the years, but we're, we don't have data like that. But, but it seems to me when you talk about the risks, right? The, the cons is you talked about uh, having to raise wages to keep up. I think any business in this room can talk about having to do that. Yeah. Uh, COVID, right? The prison being shut down. Well, you, you could have. You know, especially if you're employing families, right? I've had three or four people missing like that out of a, a workforce because you maybe employ 
several family members. Mm -hmm. And I guess my point, those risks are the same risks, whether you're, you're opening up your process to this population or not. Right. The risks are, are the same yeah. and they're probably no greater than anything else. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't see this as a risky thing. I, I don't, I just don't see an ounce of risk in it. Um, that's just me. Can I ask a question? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. This, is Benny, this is Benny Greer from ICCB. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It's very inspiring. Uh, thank you for the work with the uh, work release individuals. What percentage of those who are on work release actually become uh, regular employees? And do they do they reapply once they are um, for, uh, formally incarcerated? Uh, no, they released. don't. No, they just, they roll right in, into it. Um, I would say the, the, the day release is, is brand new. So it's, it's really only been going on for about seven months. So um, I'm trying to think. Brock is the first one in that program that's being released and he's coming back to work for us. Um, or he has, I guess uh, he was released yesterday. So um, we've, we've hired. Very good. We've hired uh, around six post release um, that had some training that was provided uh, by Blackhawk East through the work workforce um, or paid for by the workforce board. Um, out of those, uh, uh, let's see, we hired, yeah, we hired six and one is still with us. So one workforce for about two and a half years, uh, one workforce, uh, they probably on average probably worked at least a year. And then they kind of got their bearings and, and maybe figure out what they want to do in life and found jobs maybe closer to family and homes. And so- um, And that was yeah. after they were released? That was that? Uh, was post, post, post release. release. Post release, okay, good. Very good, thank you. But I, as of now, the, the day release, um, as I've talked with them, uh, probably at least half, maybe three quarters are planning on staying because they like what they're doing. Um, it'll be an easy transition back in. Um, whether they stay long term, we don't know. Um, but as of now, they, they've, they've kind of found their community of, uh, of people they work for or work with, kind of found stable employment. And we also help find them uh, housing in Kiwani as well. I've got... I've got some uh, different landowners or uh, apartment uh, people that I know that, and I kind of vouch for them and, and um, they've been able to take them on. So that, that's another area we try to help with. Do you have to change any processes? Um, manufacturing processes or general work processes? A little bit to accommodate the six hour work day versus the 10 hours. So just the timing. Yeah. Yeah. Everything else, uh, people, how they interact, not really. They just kind of, well, when they're at our facility, they, the guards are just kind of there to keep an eye and but they don't get involved. It's just, they interact with all of our supervisors, all of our employees. Uh, I think the front office, they're, they're just, they're welcome. Pretty much anywhere. Blanche. Okay, do this one in the room, then we'll go to Blanche. Sure. I'm just wondering what, what are some of the most important skills that you would want them to learn inside the facility before they come to you through day release or or program closing, both 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 welding or other employability skills. 
Now, if there's one thing I'm weak on, it is manufacturing uh, expertise or to the technical part of it. I'm more of the on the business side of it, sales, marketing, business side of it. Um, well, let's see. My production supervisor can tell you right off the bat. <laughs> um, we don't do a lot of blueprint reading, so we don't need a lot of blueprint reading. Um, different, I guess the different metals, we use a, a wear plate, hard ox wear plate, so it takes a little bit different um, process on, um, on welding. So that would be important um, in, the, in how different uh, materials are welded. Um, using a plasma, you know, that's pretty common, plasma. Uh, fabrication skills would be really nice because uh, there are times in the manufacturing where we have to do some, a little bit of fabrication. So to be able to think through a, how, how to fab something other than just push a weld. So, but if you want a little bit deeper dive into what, uh, what they really would like, I, I can hook you up with my production supervisor and I'm sure they can tell you. Yeah. Blanche, you had a question? I did, thank you. First of all, thank you for your presentation and for your leadership in this program. It takes champions to make these programs work. So thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering how many companies in the community participate in the program? How are individuals selected to go to a company and what's that application process like? Well, I can, I can, I can, Mark or someone might be able to speak on if there's anybody else that participates, but what, what we did, we, we told the, uh, asked the warden or the assistant warden, hey, we, we would like um, some guys that already had those skills that they know of that's inside the prison. Um, and some of your, I guess, guys that deserve it, you know, people, uh, returning citizens that have um, displayed ex or, uh, good character, uh, good leadership, um, people that just deserve it, who would you recommend? And, and they, they've really recommended that the first uh, six or the first nine to us. Um, and I think they, they understand kids or the assistant warden and then they understand because they do put some of these guys to work like in the maintenance shop and so forth within the prison so they kind of know what their skills are so we've taken their recommendations moving forward i'm not sure what we're kind of working through that process on who gets the opportunity because it truly is an opportunity for them and it's it's a highly sought after opportunity um so i don't know yet we're kind of working through that process of who gets chosen and why and, and all that. So the other uh, employers, are there some Mark? I, I don't know of any, but. There are day release uh, employers that are not funded through our workforce system. So the city of Kiwani uses individuals in custody um, for day release work experiences. And there's, and the name escapes me right now, but one of the not-for-profit organizations that does work in rest areas on the interstate highway system has used some uh, individuals in custody. So these provide work experiences that are not necessarily compensated um, at the level of Midwest trailer manufacturing. Uh, we, uh, it, it took a long time to get to this point from a workforce experience. And Mike Massey and I, and uh, uh, Teresa Cherry and, and Sarah Cleveland, uh, working with the Illinois Department of Corrections over two governor's administrations, many trips to Chicago and Springfield. Um, there was, uh, I mean, this was a paradigm shift. And so today, for the on-the-job training, we are using uh, the standard contract of the Illinois Department of Commerce. We're using the standard training outline of the Illinois Department of Commerce, and and so we, and that 
to get this started seven months ago or whenever it was a local meeting that involved the Illinois Department of Corrections. Um, a big proponent uh, is the assistant warden of operations. And historically, all of our work was with the assistant warden of programs and various wardens and with and including a special grant for both here and Logan and Murfreesboro. Um, so it, it evolved over a period of time. We made a lot of progress. We had a huge roadblock when everything came to a halt at the beginning of the pandemic, and now we're kind of getting restarted. But you know, our business engagement and our career planners are very involved in this, just like a Um, and uh, and so it's uh, um, it, one of your questions about uh, uh, results. Um, the another place where the results will will become apparent is in our performance measures, because we're you know we're doing these as part of our adult funding. Um, our special grant uh, uh, ended, and and we. Uh, we apply for other grants, um, um, and uh, and so that you know, for those of you who are workforce professionals, I think you know what I'm talking about, and and even some of you that are not um, professionals but volunteers in this or business people, uh, if you've used a an on-the-job training contract. Uh, in the state of Illinois through the workforce system, it's probably exactly the same one that, that we're using here. Cool. Well, thank uh, you. So, so to keep us moving, um, I think next we have Brock, right? Or, yep. Water's open. Does anybody else need a water? Yes, there are. Water. Okay. Okay. Just want to make sure. Help yourself if you need water. All right. As you all know, I'm Brock Isbell. Um, I was just released yesterday, 8.30 a.m. Uh, I'd like to start mean? out by giving everybody that made this happen for me, this experience happen for me, special thanks. I'd also like to thank Jamie Lannister. She was there every step of the way, making sure we had the proper safety equipment and stuff that we needed. Special thanks to her. Um, I'm going to start out with a little preview of my upbringing. Um, I guess I had a very poor upbringing, you could say. Uh, my dad was a drug dealer. He did fed and uh, fed time and stay time. My mom, there was just open drug use in the house. Um, I'm in for aggravated meth manufacturing. Uh, I was I was sentenced to 12 years at 75 percent on June 5th, June 24th, 2014. Um, I did eight years, and this is where I'm at now. Um, through the job, through the AJC, um, this gave me the opportunity to really put myself to use again. Um, I had welding skills before this. I used to weld for MoDOT at one point in time. I welded for Missouri Department of Transportation, um, so I had a little bit of skills and know how it been was looking for. Um, this gave me the opportunity to put my life back together. Without this, I wouldn't be wearing these clothes today. Through Ben and what the AJC did for me, I now have my own money. I'm rolled to my own place. Um, this gave me self value again. It made me feel kind of like a human again. Um, when you're in there, it kind of takes all that away from you. It's just a whole other world. Uh, I don't, it's really too much to explain, but it's. This is a big deal for us. I mean, this really puts us back together and gives us what we need to come back in society. The social experience, the self value that we had. I mean, without this, I would, I would have came out to nothing. I wouldn't have anywhere to go. I wouldn't have any, any clothes, basically. Um, I now have a job reference. I have money in the bank. I, I was able to save $7,000. And I put my license, I paid off my license. I'm actually uh, getting SR22 insurance when I get in office today, and I'm going to take my driving test to get my license back. <laughs> um, I also want to let you guys know if there's any questions you want to ask, I'm very open. Ask away. Um, 
I don't know what else to say. Um, and real quick, Brock, are you at the front of the room? We're having a little bit of a hard time hearing online. So I wonder if, um, are you at the front of the room? I can't tell. I am at the front of the room. Okay, perfect. I, for some reason, the mic is having a little bit of a hard time um, picking it up online. Um, so, you know, sorry to everyone in the, in the person room, um, but if you could speak lo like loudly, I think we'll hear here. Well, I'm a little nervous, so I'm speaking a little bit. <laughs> you're do no, you're doing great. I just don't want any, you're doing amazing. I just don't want anyone to miss it online. You're doing so great. All right, so uh, I started out with my upbringing. I said I had a very poor upbringing. Um, my father went to prison. Um, I kind of followed in his footsteps, selling drugs, and um, I'm, I'm in for aggravated meth manufacturing. I was sentenced to 12 years at 75% um, due to my good behavior and, I guess, programming. I took all programmings that were offered to me, so I got out after eight years. Um, and through the AJC, it gave me, this provided me with the money that I needed to reintegrate. I mean, without that, I wouldn't have housing. I've rolled my own housing. Um, the clothes I wear today, I bought with my own money. Um, I paid my license off from in there. I'm getting uh, SR22 insurance today. I'm going to take my driving test to uh, get my license back. Um, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, it's I got food in my refrigerator. I, I got clothes in my closet, and it's all from the, the AJC. I mean, without this opportunity, I really have nothing. Nowhere to go, no nothing. I mean, this has really put me together and gave me a great head start. Yes, ma'am. First of all, thank you for sharing your story and being open. Um, my question is, are you from the area? And if not, is this what made you stay in the area, the, the job opportunity? I'm not from this area. Um, I'm from Keysport, Illinois, Carlisle Lake area, if anybody knows that. Um, and yes, this is what made me stay here. Uh, I'm going to take this time. I already have an appointment. I'm going to take this time to figure out what I want to do with my life and you know, chill. I don't want to rush into anything and make any rash decisions. So, yes, this is. Yes, sir. Um, uh, congratulations, first of all. I'm just, can you talk us through a little bit, like how you found out about the program? Was it someone on the DOC staff or EJC or community college? Kind of how, how you got set up? And Well, uh, Leonis Carter, a man that he mentioned earlier, who works for MTM as well, uh, he was really into welding and I have a strong background. So I taught him how to weld in the maintenance department at Kiwani because everything was shut down due to COVID. Mm -hmm. So uh, me and him were pushing for like some kind of welding program, something we could put together, pure lead or something like that. And uh, I guess we kind of just stayed on him and for others, you know, the word of operations brought this to us and it kind of flourished from there. It went from there. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Thanks um, again for sharing. Um, just curious, as far as programming, did you pursue any education opp educational opportunities? Uh, I just got my GED. I started working while I was getting my GED, and they were kind of they were having a little bit of a fit about it, to be honest. And uh, who's they? I should say some of the education people in Kiwani. Okay. So what I did is. Uh, I started studying myself every night, like three or four hours, because they want you to go take these classes during the day on a computer. So I started studying myself every night, you know, three or four hours after work, and then just kept going through my testing and testing. I received my GED like about a couple months before I got out. Do you do you intend to pursue any further education to kind of further your skills? I'm gonna be honest, I don't know what I want to do yet. Um, I had a strong background in electric and heating and cooling. And uh, I'm thinking about maybe getting back into that. Um, I got away from kind of like my upbringing for a short period of time, um, away from the drugs and everything. I met a nice girl, got married, had a kid. Um, I ended up with a DUI one night, lost my license, couldn't drive back and forth to St. Louis, and kind of just fell back into what I knew. Yes, sir. Of the skills that you learned, <clears throat> Preparing you for the job. What isn't there? What else would have been helpful? You know, I had a strong background in welding and fabrication, and I was doing it in all the facilities I was incarcerated in. So for me, it really wasn't a hard transition into what they were asking for me. Um, I actually flourished. I now packed together their big trailers. 
I keep I kept moving up in the company. Um, you know, I think some of these guys could probably get a little bit more welding experience. I think it would help in and out and it would help the guys coming in and out. They need a little bit more welding experience or just basic basic knowledge of you know small fabrication and welding would have really helped some of the other guys I was with. Yes, ma'am. The, the skills that you've been focusing on are kind of those technical hard skills. Does the program have anything, I guess, I'm thinking about like around the social aspects of reintegrating back into a workplace, or is that something that is needed? Not really. Um, you know, over there it wasn't hard. Everybody was very welcoming and very accepting of everything. Um, now, me getting out, honestly, yesterday I had a I don't know if you call it a meltdown, an anxiety attack in Walmart. I don't know what, what it was, just all the people and everything. Luckily, I had somebody that was able to kind of calm me down and kind of get me out of there. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know. That's kind of a hard one to answer. I mean, I guess when we got there, we kind of left prison behind and everything. We were just so happy to be there and everything was so new. And kind of everything just kind of fell into place. So if I can ask you differently, maybe, is while you were at q because you've been at q for how long uh, prior to the last seven months? I was there about 17 months. Okay, so in those first months, do you meet with counselors and do you talk about what it looks like and is there programming, social services? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. meet with a social worker and uh, you kind of try to pick what classes you want to take. Okay. Now, when I got there, everything was very limited. They told me, right. it's like, I thought I was going to a place that had college and welding program, this, you know, all kinds right. of stuff. Um, and, and that just wasn't there. So so as part of coming to Kiwani, though, they do have a kind of a structured program to, yes. to not just support the technical, but to support you as a whole person yeah, of yeah. how decision-making, right? So that you don't end up where you were and what to appreciate the social and emotional aspect. Yes, well. there's a, they have many programs like a criminal thinking, you know, it breaks down your criminal thinking and kind of teaches you like different cognitive behaviors. Um, they have anger management, you know, it, with real health, you know, healthcare professionals, uh, domestic violence classes with real healthcare professionals. Um, they have several, several things there. And then you have a, uh, like a standard 90 day class, like you have to go through like adult living. And it's like mock budgets and you get a mock job and it, it just kind of puts you back into a you know, perspective. Because a lot of people think that they're just gonna get out of prison and make a million dollars overnight. And that's, <laughs> Doesn't happen, doesn't know it's not real. <laughs> so it kind of brings it back to reality. Yeah. And, and Mark, I know you've done a lot of stuff with IOC. Can you maybe is is that common that Kiwani is kind of special, right? But I know at home we have uh Stateville, and I know they have a reentry center. They do similar type programs. So re regardless of the facility, a lot of them have programming, but maybe not to the degree that maybe Brock benefited from. Would you agree with that? Yes, there's progress being made on adding re-entry to other facilities around the state. Um, it started with Kiwani and Murfreesboro, another adult male facility uh, close to Carbondale, Illinois, and then a cohort of the female population at Logan. And, um, and the assistant warden of programs when we started here in Kiwani was Jennifer Perrick. And now she's uh, the director of programs for the entire state of Illinois. And so there are um, re-entry counselors, uh, which is a level three position, I think, in many more facilities. Um, programming is being rolled out uh, in other facilities. And, and so it's, uh, it's not fully developed yet, but, uh, and, 
And although progress continued to be made, as Brock said, a lot of things got uh, suspended or shut down during the pandemic. We had, we had a career planner inside the facility three days a week uh, who was prohibited from going during the pandemic. Uh, the Illinois Department of Employment Security had an employment service person in there one day a week. Um, Lakeland College provided uh, manufacturing and maintenance educational programs inside the facility. Um, and, and just so many things uh, with so many partner organizations, state and local government and, and state and local not-for-profit organizations uh, were suspended um, totally during the pandemic and we're still kind of rebuilding that. But uh, with the, um, so Jennifer Perrick uh, uh, has been promoted a couple of times and is really a dynamo for re-entry in the state of Illinois. And, uh, and then her boss, uh, uh, Alyssa Williams, is now uh, a deputy director uh, of the Illinois Department of Corrections, and they really have pushed to expand this type of reentry program around the state. Perfect. But it's it's in Kiwani. It's not yet what it was when we were all told to go home because of the pandemic. We still have a lot of rebuilding to do. I've I've personally never seen the amount of programming and care in any facility. Yeah. I've been to several facilities. I was a little bit of a turd when I first started my uh, <laughs> my incarceration. I went through several different facilities. I've never seen what I've seen before. Yeah. It, uh, so I don't know if you've used this term, Brock, but some of the guys I've become acquainted with use the uh, term from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory when they when they apply and get accepted into Kiwani, they get the golden ticket. Yeah. Yep. And uh, uh, and I think that's that's really meaningful. And based on the number of applications uh, and the success of the program, the reduction in recidivism, and now it's been it's mature enough that there's statistics. Um, and the way it helps businesses and the way it helps individuals, um, we all can if if you know somebody, tell them to keep expanding the program. I have a question. Yes. Congratulations, first of all, for being for your post release. And um, did you receive meritorious good time for being in the program? Uh, I did receive good time for being in the programs. Good. I also and received good time for my GED. Can I give you a bit of encouragement? Yes, sir. Get yourself a goal, especially an educational goal. Keep your eye on the prize. Okay. It's kind of why I stayed here, uh, kind of figured out like a three year and a five year, you know, I want to figure out what I want to do. You know, I don't want to make any rash decisions. I want to find something that either has a good pension or some kind of benefits that's going to, you know, do me well in the future. Are you on parole? I am on parole. How long are you on parole for? I am on for four years. Make a, sex, a successful completion of that parole by getting yourself a goal for you and for your family. Okay. Thank you. Sir. But congratulations. Well, thank you. Hi, it's Molly. I'm just going to pop in here. Um, we have one more question here online from Melina. And then I see we have a little less than 20 minutes left. Um, and um, so I'm wondering if after Melina, um, we um, speak to Jeff a little bit. Yep. Perfect. And, and we, it is okay if we go, is everybody online and in the room okay if we go a little bit over for this great topic? Okay. It won't take me more than four hours. Thank you. I'll stand. <laughs> so, so go, go ahead with that question. Okay, first I wanted to say congratulations on your release and thank you for being vulnerable with your story, especially going back as far as you did. And I'm just wondering, now that you've 
gone through this program and seen what a difference it made for you, do you have any plans for um, mentoring other people that are still inside and, and working or advocating for the program? I mean, that's why I came here today is because I wanted to give back a little bit of what was given to me. But um, I mean, that's something I would probably be interested in, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Brock. Congrats, man. That's very good, very cool. Very, very cool. Molly, you want to drive? You can get it called up or you want me to drive? Um, that's totally up to you, Jeff. It should be set up on that um, computer kiosk where you can you'll be able to um see oh. your PowerPoint and that Zoom is a co-host, so you can share from there or I can share. That's um got it. I think I'm I think I'm set up. Okay, you are? Okay, great. There we go. Is that pop up? Yep. yep. Um, so you're going to need to share your screen on Zoom as well. So if you can pop into the Zoom, so then um, we'll be able to see it on this end. Okay. We need to, do you want to drive? Okay. Let me just do the share for you. <laughs> That's perfect. There we go. I've got part of it chewed off by the uh, by the bar. How's that go? This bar should disappear. Oh, well, while he's doing that, figure that one out. Uh, I'm Jeff Morbat. Uh, I'm from PLZ Corp. PLZ is a, an, an organization that does rigid packaging and aerosol packaging for a whole host of industries and consumers. Um, I can't talk a whole lot about what brands we, we service, but you've all seen them. Uh, they're everywhere, all around you in grocery stores. That's that, that'd be fine. You can do that. Okay. Um, so we're, 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 this is a little bit different discussion. We're a larger corporation. Uh, we're scattered around various sites in North America, Canada, and, and the United States. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, is uh, somewhat experiential uh, as a larger employer uh, wanting to hire you. Um, and, and why would I want to do that? They're, they're absolutely, as we heard from you, know, from you Ben, there's, there's, there's a humanitarian side of this. There's a, to, to, to use your word, there's a Christian side of this. There's, a, there's, a, there's an obligation as, as, a, as just people that, that need to get up every day and value each other's existence to, to do this. This is going to be a different conversation. I'm going to speak from the standpoint of an employer and a business that there is a very real business need to think about, I guess what I'd call it, non-traditional workers. Because to, to points have been made several times. Um, if, if, if somebody's got some sort of a criminal activity or criminal history or, or, or justice involvement on their resume, it's going to pop up. Whether it's, in, whether it's laid out on a resume or whether it's not, it's going to pop up in a background check. And there's a stigma associated with that, right? And, and it makes it challenging. Well, well I'm, I'm telling you, and I'm going to show you with data, that that attitude is no longer viable in the current labor market. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about. And so then what do you do about it, right? So, so we'll start off with just who is this? What's how this thing type? Technology's great, but it works. <laughs> it works. There we go. Does this work? Let's see. Go. Cool. Got cool. it. Got it. All right. So PLZ. What is PLZ? Like I said, we, we, we put things in cans and bottles. But but this is this is what we're about as a company. This is why we we exist. It's our purpose as a company. We we want to be a partner for the people who we service and we want to make products that make people's lives better. And we have values with which we execute that particular value proposition. I'm going to use that word a lot, value. We generate value safely with a customer focus, with high integrity, with an expectation of great performance, continuous improvement in teamwork, right? Pretty, pretty, pretty uh, standard, but also it's real. So is this. Oh, too bad, you can't see the bar at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So the Illinois Department of Correction has Kiwani, right? And Kiwani has its objectives and its mission. And it's to, to build valuable life skills and prepare people to, to 
re-enter society successfully. That's an important point, successfully. That, that the focus is on people who are ready to make a successful integration back into to the society and how we do that. What you can't see because there's a bar hiding at the very bottom is it talks about that, that exactly what we talked about, offering educational opportunities, offering vocational opportunities, offering, offering social ability and, and socialization to the, the residents there so that when they come out into today and they're in Walmart, they're a little more comfortable than, 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 uh, than maybe they would be if they didn't have that kind of care. So when you look at these things taken together, how many touches that this thing got? Sorry. <laughs> Just trying to get no, it all good. Your slides. There we go. When you when you look at this, there's a harmony there. There's a natural resonance between what we do and how we define ourselves as a company, and what Department of Corrections need, is is imparting into its citizens as they come back. Right. So so we 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 want to build valuable skills so that we can gain that performance. We want to make successful integrations into the community so that we can be uh, an integral part of that community and give back to the local economy. We, we want people to be ready to do jobs. We want them to have that pre-vocational training so that we can exercise teamwork and get that performance that we're after. There's just a natural harmony. And, and we'll explore that a little bit a little bit further because there's a problem with all this. Around about 1970, we decided to stop having babies. So when you look at when you look at the falling birth rates that, that have existed in this country, from 1940 to 1960, we were above the placement rate. Someplace out in the middle 70s, thanks to a number of social changes. There's a lot of social changes. They're always really hot button political items, but at the end of the day, there were social changes to, to our society that caused us to become dual income, no children households. A whole bunch of reasons. When that happened, we stopped replacing people at the rate they were dying. And that starts to create a problem nearly immediately. But it resonated through three generations of, of people coming up. So for a business to grow, I've got to have a workforce. I've got to have that workforce be very productive because there's less of it out there. So they must be productive. I have to develop, invest in people and develop their skills. I, I have to see non-traditional sources. I can't rely on immigrants and I can't rely on the churn between companies to keep me fed because we're two and a half million people every year short of what we need. So when you look at the people that are going into the workforce, that, that denominator down here, the labor force participation rate, that number shrinking. The working age people is, is compressing and getting smaller and smaller. So just naturally by mathematics, we find ourselves in a shrinking availability of workforce. The labor force is reducing. So for a business to grow, it's got to find new pipelines for labor, which I now postulate we have to think about places that we haven't thought about before or worse yet, which due to a stigma we don't go to before. We specifically prohibited ourselves from participating in, right? So we, we can't, we, we, we've got to do something different is what it really comes down to. So what kind of a response can we have? There was a resident, uh, I don't know if you ever met him, his name was Ricky Hamilton. Yeah. You know Ricky? Yeah. I love Ricky. He's, he, 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 wrote, he wrote this. Um, it's in your, uh, your easy. This is a January 2019 issue number one of the easy uh, out of the Hawaii Life Reentry Center. Blue is business leveraging underutilized fel felons. Ricky came up with that. And these are his words. There exists a nearly forgotten population. I'm just going to read it because it's a great quote. There's a nearly forgotten population of men and women in the state of Illinois who seek an opportunity to contribute to our state in a positive way, both socially and economically. I could not have said that better if I had to. And then, so what's the next thing? What, what the ask was, when I was in, over at Kiwani before the COVID outbreak, what the ask of guys like me was, would you guys please go invest in this renewable resource? It's a sustainable, renewable pipeline for labor that's out there. 600,000 people get released in this, this country every year out of the prison system. And, and they have trouble finding jobs. And we need two and a half million people to close the gap every year. There, there, there's, there's reciprocity that needs to be explored. So what's the objective? Provide access and opportunity to the workforce for re-entrants. Drop the stigma. Add them to the local workforce roster. But in order for you to do that, you're going to have to think about the investment you're going to make. And that's what we're going to talk more about here in just a second. You, we, if we're going to supplement the economy, and if we're going to be successful as a business, we need to go find these, find ways to get this to happen. At the same time we stopped making babies, unfortunately, more people started going away. This is a, a curve of 
what the incarceration rate has looked like over the past several years. Um, the last one over there on the side is where we are in 2021. You see the, the curve kind of flattened a little bit. We're about 1.4 now. We were about 1.45. Uh, we were at 1380 in 2019. So the folks coming out are a valuable resource. And why are they a valuable resource? Because each and every single person born into this world has value. Our job is to go figure out how to tap into that and, and, and create opportunities to, to leverage that. The, the book that was talked about earlier, um, I have read it. Uh, great book, good, good, uh, good playbook for what I'm talking about. Um, I love this particular quote out of it. Our deepest and broadest labor opportunity in that to close that gap uh, comes from the ranks of the underemployed who have, are, are not being employed because they have a criminal record, right? So this is, this is sort of what we do about it. It's a term that I use called value reciprocity. And what does that mean? It's a fancy way of, of saying that for, for you, for you coming out here, um, is, is any person who is incarcerated uh, maybe doesn't completely recognize they are motivated and they have, a, they have a value to offer to anybody. Their skills, you were a welder before you went in. D1.1 probably working for MoDOT in terms of AWI certification. Uh, all you had to do is pass the class. That's oh, there you go. That's even better. Yeah. But it's something that you had. So you had technical skills, you had a technical acumen, you had something to offer. That's that by the point. <laughs> Motivation, I, I, need, I need employment. Got to make a living, right? Yeah, so, so, so then you look at that and you say, what does an employer need? I can, I can weld. I, I've got a mechanical skill. I want to work. Hey, employer, take me. That top, that top one is, is the one we have to work on. Employer, you need to take me. Uh, I'll tell you just a quick story because then we're out of time. The place I came from, the place I am, uh, Hillenbrand had a policy, written policy. We will not uh, hire anyone with a felony, period. The end. And, and so I was trying to do this in that environment. Nine months of significant discussions back and forth all the way up to the leadership of the company did not produce much of a result. So I ended up in, that's when I started meeting people. Um, I was trying to figure out how to work through this. I met a great guy down in Southern Illinois, you all know him, Rick Stubblefield. He introduced me to another guy, rock star navigator. He's on the phone right now. Ladies and gentlemen, Lee, Lee Reese, take a bow. <laughs> <laughs> he knows I love him. And, and they, they opened me up to all y'all, as they like to say. And so I started becoming more educated in, in not just talking about why can't we do some of this, but how can we do some of that so that I could go leverage success with, with my company. And over the course of time, what I'm going to share next are just things that we learned about what it meant to, to, to do this. This is not easy, right? So as an employer, I have a need. What do I need? I need labor. Um, I want to leverage the motivation of the folks who need jobs. So I have to provide them that access. That's the only way I'm going to leverage that motivation. They need work. I got to give them opportunity and access. I've got to understand what, who they are in their skills, who they are in their persona, so that I understand how to develop their skills and acumen so that they can be successful in that. And then guess what? I succeed. That's the, that's the reciprocity. This value reciprocity thing is... There's an employment need for, the, for the, 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 the person. They're motivated to work. They have something to offer. The business needs people. The, the, the business has an ability to provide that opportunity and develop them. And this continues and this never ends. So when we talk about what are you going to do next? So we're going to develop even more skills. You're going to be, become more and more skilled so that your, your personal value goes up. That's, you are stacking your credentials such that you're developing personal marketable skills and becoming more valuable. Right? That's the game. So how do you get started in that? The first thing is have a vision to do it and commit to it. Don't talk about it. Don't, 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 don't think about swimming, jump in the pool and you'll figure it out. Right? So some of the things that I have learned is that you can have a goal but without a plan. It's just a wish. You're not going to get there. So, so the plan you know, is that, that whole adage. We've all heard that failing, failing to plan is planning to fail. You've got to have a plan because this is complicated. Some questions were already asked around the table today about that complexity. When you think about this, and you said it perfectly, and thank you for setting me up, because when you get out, you get what? Four changes of clothes, a duffel bag, 200 bucks or so. They don't do that anymore. Some states do that. Four changes, four changes of clothes, 200 bucks, and a ticket to wherever you want to go. It's kind of standard. Pants and I think 100 bucks. There you go. So it's not much, right? So, so coming out the door they're, they're of, of, of any of the institutions, there's a problem. I, I need to have somewhere to go and I need to have something to do. So the first thing is understand your source. We have recruiters that we pay a lot of money to to go be our source of, 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 uh, 
of, of employees. Here, it's a little bit of an inverse relationship. You've got to go figure out where are the sources. You develop partnerships with the people in this room. You develop those partnerships and you understand through people like AJC, through the work development boards, through the innovation boards like this one, where the feedstock is for this, for this idea. Where, where can I go get people? And how do I go get people? What, what's the process? Because it's not, it's not easy. You got to get You got to interview. Them. So if you want to interview them and you want to do the selection process, have a defined criteria. Go in there knowing you, you're going to hear some stuff. And I'm not being ugly here. I'm truly not. My heart goes out to the, to the gentleman who killed a, killed a relative. My heart just goes out to him. But you're going to hear those stories. You should hear those stories. And you know that that's the reality. So what we have to get over as the employers is not accepting that reality. It is a reality. So Look, listen to the referral system. Look down. Again, you guys really set me up well for this discussion. There are referrals that you can get from people that you were in with. You know, hey, Bob, write me a letter. From I was in Oakwood Day Release Program, write me a letter. I have a relationship with, with, with the warden, write me a letter. Because that's what you've got to go on. Before, we, before the time you're incarcerated, absolutely use those things. Get them out there and say, this, this is some of my skills that I have. But use what you got and what you've been learning. I took these classes. I, I experienced these things. I got my GED. That says something about you and your character. And that's what we're hiring. We're hiring you. I'm not hiring your skills. I'm not hiring what you know or what you did. I'm hiring you. Right? So that whole idea then gets you to a point where pre-release, and then you can speak to the value of this better than I can. Pre-release, get into the institution, get connected to the people in the institution, and make sure that that particular facility allows you to have the discussion that you can make a hiring decision with and offer the job before they leave. Why? What peace of mind do you have knowing that you're walking into a job? It's a lot. It's a lot. So from that moment forward, once you've, off, once you've extended the offer, most likely you're gonna get it accepted. From the moment that you've extended that offer, you've made a commitment to do the rest of this. Because it is a commitment. That's why I say you gotta have a plan. Coming out of the door, I, as a business, I can't provide housing. I can't provide you transportation. I can't provide you food, shelter, clothing, or any of that stuff. That's, that's, that's not what I can do. I can offer you the job part. But guess what? There are people in this room that are connected to all of those resources. So that's where that partnership comes in again, right? Where, how, how do I leverage those relationships, all the people that Mark hangs out with? How do I go and work, work, those, work those particular networks? To make sure that you're cool coming out because what i want you thinking about when you're coming out is your first day of work safety and what you're going to do to start developing skills from that moment going forward i don't need you worrying about food and shelter and all the rest of that so we got to take care of that before you get there that's the hard part this is not easy right but we got to do it to do this what we have to so so the, the the next piece of it then that training piece of it what are you going to do now that you're out again thank you the gentleman who said you got to have a goal you absolutely need a goal because this Life is a continual development and a continual change, right? So if we're going to do it for the good, we got to understand where are you, and we got to lead from where you are to where you need to go. What's that goal? Um, it can be things like apprenticeships. And again, my rock star, Lee Reese, he helped me through all of that to understand how to get better welding out in front of folks, how to get NIMS training out of folks to, be, to, to do that. There's a whole program that you can open up. It works everywhere. This whole idea of stackable credentials that take us to a new place continually throughout our careers, because this is a career thought process, right? So who's doing this? There's a few people. These, <laughs> these, this, this, is, this is taken, uh, this is a list that was generated of just people who have um, affirmative action programs. When I say by that, I don't mean uh, EEOC type stuff. They are affirming and they have put plans together to go out, seek and harvest their labor from this source. So they're getting in line first, right? So there's quite a, quite a few names up there that, that probably are recognizable. So the other important part, and it's most important to the reentrant, is I'm getting out. I got I to gotta make a living. That's different than get a job. Get a job as a janitor in a high rise is not a living forever. If it's where you got to start, okay, everybody starts somewhere, right? So it's not the end of the game. The end of the game is how do I make a comfortable living, have my family, raise my children, and be successful so I don't go back and, and land back where I was. Recidivism, recidivism is a disease that can be overcome by stuff like this. So it starts with an understanding of what do people need. If y'all went through any kind of psychology class, you know this you know this triangle. So coming out the door, very first thing I need to have is food and shelter. Okay, we talked about that already. 
The next thing is I got I to gotta be safe and I got to be secure. That has something to do with where you live and how you live and also the place that you're employed. Okay, we, we talked about that. Now it gets a little different. I got to belong to something. I got to be part of something. I came from a community, the community of the incarcerated people. I got to go to someplace else where even he said they love each other. It's true. So you got to love them back. You know, you got, you got, they got to feel that coming in. It's really, really important. And you got to give them a sense of accomplishment. There's got to be something to do. I got to go to something every day. I say, if I guess if I just go to work, I can be that janitor. Uh -uh. I'm going to have a living to raise my family, to, to, to take care of my life, right? So, so that whole sense of achievement is part of the program. So you can answer the psychological needs and you can answer the self-fulfillment needs. The, 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 that, re, that reciprocal value equation gives you all of that, right? It starts with, I'm coming into a job. And the first thing I'm gonna do in a job is I'm gonna start learning what it is you want me to do. I'm gonna have on a job learning and I'm gonna go figure that out. But that initial assignment and that basic skill development is only the absolute very beginning. In your, in your company where you're making the trade or the quality control, maybe I'm interested in being quality. If I wanna be in quality, there's things that I can do. I can get with the American Society of Quality and I can certify someone as as a, a, an improvement associate, they get a credential. It's something they have for the rest of life and nobody can take it away from them. If from there, if I really kind of like this, I can be a certified quality technician. If I really, really like this, I can do the work to get a degree and become a, a, a quality engineer. The, the uh, quality engineer roles are pulling down to ninety to $100,000 a year. I can do that. I, maybe that wasn't my thing. Maybe what I really like is just making stuff. I, I like making stuff. So. I like making stuff. I can start off with just becoming a, a, a production technician. And, and then as that sort of advances, I can say, you know what? And I met this guy. He actually just started his engineering degree this year. One of my apprentices who is a re-entrant. Um, he, he's going to SIUE now to be an engineer because he said, I like to make stuff. He did this. He became a technologist. He's now he's got his certifications manufacturing engineer. Now he's getting the big skin paper to go underneath it to say, I'm also a, a degree engineer with a baccalaureate. Right? So these are expensive things. How's that done? They reach Rockstar. Are you still there? <laughs> Lee, Lee pointed me on the path to the apprenticeships. Eric, yeah, Rick, Stubble, Rick Stubblefield and Matt uh, Jones pointed me on the, 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 the grants and the, the work programs so that through these partnerships, through the U.S. Department of Labor, through the state of Illinois, I could partner up with SWIC because SWIC was part of this journey. Um, I could partner up with high schools. I can actually capture people in Collinsville, in East St. Louis, in Belleville 201, and bring them into a summer intern program to keep them from being in a gang in the first damn place, right? It's, 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 all, it's, it's all doable. So out of that, we can get the vocational training that we're looking for. We can get the apprenticeships that credential those, those particular things. Uh, the, the work grant program, the training grant, grant programs offset my indirect labor costs so that it's not killing our EBITDA and I'm still being profitable. You mentioned it. It was, a, it was, a, it was a break even, right? The uh, the trade school programs, the adult education programs, they're all out there through these kind of partnerships, and that's what it's about. It's all about these partnerships. These partnerships can become a dynamic and extremely functional means to get to this. I know it because I've lived it. I've seen it, right? So just to sort of wrap it up, the whole idea here is leverage the skills of the reentry and and recognize them pre-incarceration and during incarceration so that you can really understand the value that they can bring. Help them discover that, right? Work on that together. That creates the pipeline, but then you got to go leverage the pipeline. You got, you got, like I said, this is hard work. There's a lot to set up to do it. Um, but it, look at what you can do with what they're learning in residence. Um, I know why IMEC is asking the questions about what else do you guys need because IMEC provides that kind of stuff. <laughs> I've used them, right? Uh, so, so, so do that and make it normal. That's part of the business proposition. It is part of the recruiting uh, function. It is part of how we go and get people resources and, and then leverage all of this to the hill. All of these, uh, these coalitions that we have available to us um, that, that will help us identify the sources, uh, design those programs for development, leverage what's out there to the, the, the extent that the business needs it and, and bring that on board. Um, knowing full well that you're going to need some help with this because you, you can't forget about the basic needs at the base of the pyramid. I got to have a safe, secure place to be. I got to have food. I got to have clothes. I got to have transportation. Sounds like a tall order. All of this is possible. 
There's, there, this, but the people that are listening right now, we can do this. <laughs> so, so the thing then becomes um, take full advantage of that. Take, take advantage of these relationships to the, to the greatest degree possible. Learn, ask, explore, and be action biased. And it just kind of happens. It's the gift that you get from it. So with that, um, thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I have a quick question, Jeff. Yeah. So what's the key to getting businesses interested in Bob? You said you had a difficulty convincing an employer to do that. So what are the what are, is there a strategy, a, a way to do that? Who do you, you have to talk to the top CEO or HR? Who do you talk to? Well, not necessarily. It, it, first of all, it comes from just need. I mean, if, if you have 200 open jobs and they're not lined up outside the door, you got to do something. Right. So this is one something you can do. And reentrants are one, one category. There's a lot of there's a lot of spokes in his wheel. Uh, challenged individuals. I, I had welders and wheelchairs in in, uh, in Belgium. Um, the, there's there's a number of different places to go. So that's what that source thing is all about. And, and once you start lining up, look, these are people, and these are these are assets that we can use to satisfy the resource requirements that we have. Well, then the conversation becomes a lot easier. Yeah. Right. And. And, and I'm not I'm not as expert as, as as my boss and people resources is in this. So I don't know if there's something you want to comment on that as well. So you start with the question, do you have a need? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this isn't this isn't uh, let's create opportunities for them. that's a different conversation. This is there's already a very real need. Right. It's not, you know, you listen to some of the newspapers and some of the rhetoric rhetoric about people that are just living on the dole and like that and don't want to come back to work. Uh-uh. We got two and a half million openings per year that we're losing because of a deficiency of just available people in the workforce. And, and, and so that's the starting point is you've got to accept that there is a deficiency and statistically and, and factually driven. So how are we going to overcome it and how we're going to be first in line so we don't lose the opportunity? So Tom, I, I have found that a lot of times it is a top-down driven process, right? You need senior leaders on board, you know, natural human behavior. You know, if you think this, for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction, right? And I think Ben's talked about it, Brock talked about it, Jeff talked about it. It's hard work, so that's an action. Right. Work is an action, there's often pushback. And often I hear among peers and business people, oh, well, we can't, <laughs> right? And, and that's often what we use. Well, if we believe we can't, we won't, right? We've got to start dropping that apostrophe T. Believe we can, and we will, because too many times we say can't and, and we don't even try, right? So you've got to start that conversation somewhere and, and be open to that. Yeah, and, and the other one is a, a relentless uh, uh, application of that concept. But, but instead of when people are coming, like transportation as an example, um, our sites in the St. Louis area are, are outside of the St. Louis area. One's out near St. Clair, Missouri. Uh, the other one is in right at the edge of Franklin and, and St. Louis counties. So it's pushed away from significant population of the workforce. So transportation is a big deal. So, so it, it can't be, we can't do that because we don't have transportation. It's transportation is the problem to solve. How do we go solve it? And then that's where all this kicks in. And, and there's, there's ways and means of doing it like share a ride and those kinds of things. Any other general questions? I just want to make a comment or offer a resource for everybody in the room to sort of support um, Mr. Horvath's uh, presentation there. There's a really good study out called America's Demographic Drought. Sam Jim is the name of it that MC Burning Glass put out. I've read it when I first read that a couple of years ago. It was just like this. It, it is, it is you know, a light, yeah. It's a revelation. It's arithmetic. Okay. And it's Math. basic foundation. It's arithmetic. We don't have enough people to fill the jobs yeah. that we have. Got to find them in non-traditional areas. <laughs> Any other questions? So Marcy had a question online. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. I, so um, my one question um, is, you know, as we're working with the Opportunity Youth, we're wondering about the juvenile justice and the support um, that they need. And I was just wondering how any of this is connected. Like I was wondering about all the businesses. Are they willing to work with the the, the students who come out of the, the I say students, but the, the children that come out of the juvenile justice system so that we prevent them somehow, you know, having that um, 
direction in that career, as you were saying, not just a job um, when they get out. So then they do not end up in the Department of Corrections um, that we have given them that uh, pathway that they need. Absolutely. So on, on when the location was where we're at now, the example I'm going to use in Belleville, Illinois. And in Belleville, um, we had the same problem. We didn't have uh, welders and we needed welders. So we leveraged uh, a relationship with the St. Louis uh, Special School District and uh, the North County Tech, South County Tech there. At, and, and this is where the SWIC journey sort of began, only it was with, um, I believe it's Dr. Menser, who is the uh, superintendent of Belleville 201, if I'm right. So, so he was a strong believer in vocational training as an alternative to college. So we went into the high schools uh, on, on their pre their career days. We actually went in in the fall and said, uh, we're, we're opening up 12 internships for uh, people who have taken welding class or who have taken machining class or shop class uh, to come and work half days for credit because the state of Illinois co-op uh, and uh, the Missouri co-ops both give you uh, credit towards your, towards your uh, diploma. We're coming to work half days. So we brought those folks in. One of the individuals that was there uh, was justice involved in St. Louis uh, County. Um, that popped, you know, when we, when we looked at, the, at, at uh, him as a candidate. Um, he had strong technical skills. So that was one of the first places there where we just said, okay, you're, you can weld, come on, let's go do it. And uh, he's, uh, uh, he, he ended up uh, coming to work for us the day he graduated. It was kind of a funny thing. It was during COVID, so it wasn't an actual graduation. It was just on the 20th of May, uh, something happened, boom, you now have a grad, you now have a degree, uh, a diploma. And uh, the next day he went to work full-time with full benefits. Uh, so, so yeah, the, the youth to work programs. And again, uh, Lee helped me, I know, I'm, you know, shout out to Lee. He's the one that introduced me to that. I didn't know about it. You know, I, it's not some natural place for me to go and talk to the economic development office in Madison County, or say, sorry, St. Clair County to, to say, hey, what have you got for youth programs? It was something that was shown to me through, uh, actually through a barbecue that is what started all this, uh, where the community was invited in. So community outreach to contact the businesses and make them aware of the opportunities that are out there to, to just leverage uh, and, and go and bring these kinds of things in, whether it's youth or, or whether it's adults, it, there's, there's lots and lots of opportunity to, to work to get that to happen. Thank you. Any other yeah, questions? Blanche, you have your hand. Yep, Lance has her hand raised online. Oh, thank you. I just um, wanted to mention that we have a program that's focused on um, adults and youth uh, with a probation office um, the Adam, in Adams County. And we have an engagement with uh, local businesses, also through Economic Development, Community College Workforce, and a local community-based organization as an in a partnership that created a program called Adams County Empowered. And it also has, so it has a direct connection on work readiness training and then a connection to local employees. Thanks, Blanche. So I, I wanna thank all the speakers today. You know, kind of the cool thing about this meeting, I know it's been a long meeting, I appreciate everybody's <coughs> tolerance of that. Um, but what a great opportunity, whether it be Kiwani and you're looking at the, the, the opportunities there, or I know I've attended uh, my first reentry summit at Stateville. We're going to our second one. And that room is filled with resources to help people reentering with housing, with food, uh, those things that Brock, you talked about, right? That he was fortunate, he was able to do it on his own because this program, there's, there's agencies out there that do that. So whether you're in this community, any community around the state, there are partnerships that are helping returning citizens, right? That there's an opportunity to partner locally wherever you're at. And it's a matter of asking the right question. So my hope, I think Mark, Mark, our hope is that this session is being recorded, that it's not just the 20 people in the room and the 20 people online that, that hear the awesome stories of today. Participating in this meeting, you'll, you'll get a link or we'll, we will share a link 
to this recording, right? Share it with others that are interested in the stories that were told here today, right? Because there's a great opportunity for, for education and wisdom to, to share. Mark, do you have any other last minute comments before I open it to public comment? No? Okay, uh, we'll open it to public comment. Molly, is there any public? I don't see any public comments, I mean. No public comments, sorry, she, she might be letting the dog, I don't know. <laughs> Advantages of working oh, yeah. from home, remote work. <laughs> So uh, if there is no public comment, uh, that adjourns this part of the, the day. Uh, again, I thank everybody for attending this quarterly session of uh, Bird Pathways for Targeted Populations. Uh, I think, you know, from here we can uh, end the meeting, adjourn, and uh, those that are staying, we have lunch, and I know I would like to get some pictures because if everybody's okay, I, I would like to share some pictures on social media to kind of share the, the great stories that we've heard today. So lunch is in this room. And again, uh, um, restrooms are down the hallway. Uh, the we'll probably all need uh, don't ever know. The stand me. just past the, <laughs> the uh, drinking fountain. Um, is the plan to meet the front door of Kiwani at, at one o'clock? Well, yes. we'll, we'll, we can depart from here. We'll make a general yeah. announcement, okay. probably. And, so. uh, and we will uh, uh, let the people at Kiwani Life Skills Reentry Center that we may be running a little bit late. If you did not sign, if you're in the room and you did not sign in, the sign in sheet is on the counter uh, near the door. Um, if you uh, do not have this book and you would like one, see me. Um, if you if you have a business card, uh, I'll take that. And if not, I'll just capture your name um, on an index card so that we know who gets these. Um, and if we uh, there's more in this box, if we run out of them, I'll uh, make arrangements to get one mailed to you. So um, okay. we will we'll leave it at that. Yep. And Molly, I think we can, or Sarah, we can stop the recording and thank you for the technical assistant. Thank you to everybody online that joined us today. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Do you all want to ask for a motion? All right, real quick, do you all want to ask for a motion to adjourn? Oh yeah, so sorry. Formal, we need a motion to adjourn. So yeah. move. Tom, okay, Tom moved it. And that's when I go in uh, seconds. Who would? That's when I go in seconds. And when I go in seconds it. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Please go nays. Oh, sorry. Nays. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Be well. Thanks, all. Bye. <laughs>